and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm Michelle Craig, a teaching stream professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto, where I regularly teach thousands of undergraduate students. I'm also one of the inaugural editors in chief for ACM Engage CSEDU, a peer reviewed collection of open access teaching materials. I chair the steering committee for the ACM SIGSI Technical Symposium, and I serve on the ACM Education Board. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, here is more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. You can see some of these highlights on your screen. ACM provides access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing awards, and the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethical, ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. Before we get started, we'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. If you have questions at any time, please type them in using Zoom's Q&A button. We'll organize the questions as Dan and Leo speak and try to get to as many as possible. This session is being recorded and will be archived you'll receive an email notification when it becomes available. Please check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our tech talks. So today's presentation is LLMs, A New Way to Teach Programming by Dan Zangaro and Leo Porter. Dan Zingaro is an associate teaching professor at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. He has taught introductory Python programming to thousands of students over the past 15 years and has written the Python textbook that is currently being used for this course. He has also written dozens of research articles about how to teach and learn introductory CS. Dan has written two books with no starch press, the aforementioned one on Python and one on algorithms. Dan's book, books have been translated into multiple languages. Leo Porter is a teaching professor in the computer science and engineering department at UC San Diego. He is best known for his research on the impact of pure instruction in computing courses, the use of clicker data to predict student outcomes, and the development of the basic data structures concept inventory. He co-teaches the popular Coursera specialization, object-oriented Java programming, data structures and beyond, with over 300,000 enrolled learners, and the first course in the edX MicroMasters in data science, Python for data science, with over 200,000 enrolled learners. Leo is a distinguished member of the ACM and previously served as secretary of the ACM SIGSI board. Both Dan and Leo have received numerous prestigious teaching and research awards. So Dan and Leo, without further ado, take it away. All right, let us just share our slides real, real quickly. We'll get started. All right, are, are those slides coming through okay? All right, so uh, thank you, Michelle. and. Uh, Thank you for that kind introduction and thank you to the ACM for talking to us, for inviting us to talk today. Um, also, thank you all for attending. Uh, we're really excited to be talking with you all. Uh, Dan and I are excited to talk with you all today about how large language models like ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot are likely gonna change the way that we all teach programming. Uh, certainly LLMs have implications for education at large and how we teach programming is not exempt. Our goal today will be to convey the motivations for changing introductory programming and our vision for teaching learners the skills they need to succeed as programmers working with an LLM. As these tools are quite new, uh, we're also excited to talk with you today during our Q&A period. 
Before we start, I want to say that Dan and I have been teaching and conducting research on CS1 for over a decade. We've studied effective pedagogies, motivations for student learning, uh, assessments of student learning, and related topics. We're leveraging that experience in this talk, but we want to be clear that we have not studied the effectiveness of LLMs in teaching programming yet. We are versed in the literature that's come out uh, on the topic, but we haven't conducted those studies ourselves. Um, our experience with uh, Copilot and ChatGPT is based on spending the past six months reading about these tools and working with them ourselves. What began as curiosity quickly became a clear recognition that introductory programming was bound to change. And we wanted to design courses at our schools to improve the outcomes for our students. Early on, we also recognized it's really hard to teach a course without a book to guide that course. And so we're authoring a book now uh, that the book and that book is available in early access. So for CS1 instructors considering our approach, we're happy to provide instructor copies of that book. And we'll talk more about the book later. Um, and we'll be teaching using this approach uh, starting in the fall of 2023. And we'll also be studying the course's outcomes. Thanks, Leo. What's up, everyone? Uh, as Leo mentioned, the literature on using LLMs to teach programming is just getting started. There's a lot we don't know, and we need much more research and replication studies of existing research before we can make any definitive claims. But, you know, um, we're education researchers. We're going to spend some time on what companies are reporting and what the literature can currently tell us, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, it's hard to overestimate the impact that LLMs are having. I, I'm sure at this point you're like sick of hearing about how, you know, the world's going to be irrevocably changed forever and ever and all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, like while we might be overestimating this in the short term, there's likely a seed of truth here. Now, for example, Satya Nadella, uh, Microsoft CEO, is talking about the fact that software development is going to fundamentally change. And like I said, we need more research to understand claims about how much faster programmers are when they use Copilot and stuff like that. But Leo and I have already been watching software development change in ways we couldn't have predicted, uh, even maybe six months ago. Uh, so similarly, Jensen Wong, that's NVIDIA uh, president and CEO, is talking about an incredibly low programming barrier on the horizon. And yeah, while we might not be fully there yet, um, if you play with Copilot on your own, just like start messing around with it, and you let your mind cast ahead a little, you might come to agree that we're not as far away as it might seem. And actually, and this is uh, was a surprise to us, the current literature kind of agrees with what these experts are saying. Uh, we're gonna start with some literature about people who already know how to program. We'll transition into introductory CS, CS1 uh, after that. So we found this recent study from GitHub that shows that 92% of developers in the US are already using these tools. So, I mean, this is staggering, right? From zero, essentially six months ago, nine months ago to 92% today. I don't know anything else that's moved that fast in the developer realm. In addition, 70% of developers are seeing strong benefits of these tools, including, and we love this one, learning new skills, right? So it's not all about productivity, it's also about learning new skills. So if working programmers are using these tools, we likely want to help students learn to use these tools as well. Um, in the first research paper we're going to discuss, we have a controlled experiment. So this is when you have one difference in how two groups work. And so that one difference can be used uh, to determine what the difference uh, is, uh, given that uh, difference between the two groups. Okay, so we have the treatment group. They're allowed to use Copilot. And the control group is not allowed to use Copilot. Other than that, they're allowed to do whatever they want. Okay, they can work, use the internet, they can look at documentation, all that. Only difference is one group has Copilot, other group doesn't. What we find is that the Copilot group completed the task 56% faster than the control group. And the authors also note that less experienced programmers benefited more, but like, okay, we, we have to talk about this like 56% increase here. Um, when education researchers have like a 5% increase in anything, we're partying. I mean, 56% is just like unheard of, okay? So I, I don't want to jump too early to conclusions here, uh, but it, we may be looking at the possibility of a staggering productivity increase. And can you imagine if indeed uh, people with less experience benefit more, 
right? In CS, uh, we're sadly very well aware of inequities in prior experience leading to inequities in outcomes, right? Perhaps LLMs, you know, with lots of effort from teachers and researchers, obviously, uh, can help rather than hurt in this regard. Uh, so in the second paper that we want to talk about, and this is what we mean that we're super early in this. Uh, so there's no 56% increase going on in this paper. Uh, so the results here are much more tempered. So what we have this time is we have a within object study. That means as each participant completes two Python tasks. Uh, so one without Copilot, they're just using IntelliSense, which is built into VS Code. And the other group is using Copilot. And like I said, there's no difference between conditions this time on success rate. Uh, but there are still positive outcomes. So for example, the majority of participants preferred using Copilot, uh, mostly because it provides a useful starting point. I mean, we've all been there. We're working on a new program, and it's a blank screen. And we're just like, you know, what are we supposed to do? How do we get started? And you don't have that problem with Copilot. It just gives you stuff. Right? Half the participants, though, did have trouble fixing the Copilot code. So for all the teachers in the audience, uh, don't worry. This is just a small preview of what's to come in our talk today. We have a lot of skills that we still need to teach our students. Okay, We're not just done. All right, so uh, we're going to move on to the immediate impacts of generative AI on CS1 now. So the introductory level uh, course that uh, people uh, take when they want to learn how to become computer scientists. All right, so the first paper that we're going to talk about makes it clear that we need to rethink our take-home assessments. So for, for decades now, uh, many of us have used small take-home assignments, coding questions, to give students focused practice on particular features of programming languages. And yeah, like we have, we've always had to worry about students like looking up answers online and stuff like that, contract cheating. But in our opinion, now using these exercises is completely game over with Copilot in the mix. Okay, so Copilot solves half of these exercises in one shot. Can just paste the exercise and boom, done. In other cases, the authors needed to improve the prompt a little bit. Uh, but when they did that, Copilot uh, could solve it. Okay, that, that's called prompt engineering. It's when you like mess around with the prompt uh, for purposes of making the response from the LLM better. But anyway, the takeaway is if you do some minor prompt engineering, then 80% of the assignments are solved just using the LLM to write the code. Uh, the next paper is a similar game over in terms of uh, um, exams. So in this paper, uh, we're seeing kind of a similar thing. Codex, that's the LLM that underlies Copilot. So Codex just solves them, right? So we, just, we cannot use these as take home uh, exams anymore or online exams or like a, really any unsupervised kind of exam anymore. All right, so it's clear that something needs to change now in CS1. And so the question is what? So researchers have interviewed instructors and you know, right now everyone's just panicking about students cheating, right? That's all everyone talks about right now. Uh, but in the long term, there are two main approaches for what to do. Uh, so first is resist these tools, and second is embrace these tools. Let's start with resist. So um, one argument for banning the tools is so that uh, we can stay focused on perceived programming fundamentals, which uh, may help students like build mental models and have an uh, um, idea of how the computer is running their programs. So some instructors are using local libraries with like thousands of lines of code and cultural context uh, to try to stay ahead of the AI right? or confuse the AI or use other types of assessments like oral or uh, video assessments or things that the AI presumably cannot do. Uh, but, you know, it probably goes without saying, I probably don't have to say it to this group in particular, but with the current pace that AI is moving, uh, we're not sure that trying to um, confuse the AI is a viable path. Uh, and also, think about how could we possibly confuse the AI and not confuse students at the same time. The arguments for embracing the tools are to prepare students for future jobs uh, and to be able to teach more advanced stuff early on. These instructors are excited about using AI to give personalized help to students. Anybody uh, who's taught a large class knows how, how time consuming uh, and generally impossible doing that is. Uh, and helping with time consuming tasks like generating exercises and reviewing student code, stuff like that. Uh, so Leo and I are obviously on the embrace the tools uh, side of things. Uh, and there are important concerns that need to be addressed. 
such as uh, equitable access to the tools and biases and training data. Uh, but one positive thing we're already seeing is LLMs are forcing us to reimagine our pedagogy, right? Reimagine how we teach. And we love what instructors are doing here. Um, Leo and I also are not convinced that we need to choose between fundamentals and preparing students for jobs. Uh, we think that both are possible, and we're going to discuss this uh, plan later in our talk. But uh, first, there's some encouraging new research evidence uh, that we wanted to talk about. All right, so that evidence comes from a recent controlled study, and we're going to you know, spend more time on this than you probably imagined we would. And the reason is we think that this is a particularly important study. So the participants in this research were young novices with no prior Python programming experience. And the participants were first introduced to some fundamentals of programming and computational thinking. And then they were asked to complete 45 tasks uh, in Python. Uh, so these tasks were two-parters. Okay, So they started with code authoring, which is writing code from scratch. And then there was a code modification task, which is uh, changing existing code to meet some uh, new goal. So as you might expect by this point, one of the groups had access to Codex uh, during the code authoring parts, and the other group didn't. Importantly, no one had access to Codex during the code modification parts. Okay, They had to make the changes to the code with no AI help. All right, so for the code authoring, right, writing code from scratch, uh, the codex group kicked butt. And you might not be surprised to hear that, right? There's statistically and practically significant results here, but it's like, well, sure, you know, we already talked about the fact that you know, LLMs do like really well on CS1 problems. So, you know, big surprise, right? Uh, you might argue, though, that the codex group would suffer later when we take codex away and ask them to modify code. I mean, OK, so I mean, the codex group just got the code like handed to them, right? Whereas the other group, the group without codex, wrote the code themselves. So certainly, they'd be better at modifying the code later, right? Right, right, right. Well, that's actually not what the researchers found. In fact, and uh, this is obviously super motivating for us as teachers, the codex group still did better. OK, so it's not statistically significant anymore, but they still did better on the code modification parts. That codex group also felt more eager to learn programming and felt less stressed, less discouraged, less irritated while completing the tasks. In case you're worried that this appears to be some uh, very short living uh, increase, it's actually not. So one week later, they did a post-test uh, retention and they still found better, but again, not significantly better, but still better results for the codex groups uh, on code authoring and code modification. And critically, there's no codex going on here, right? Codex was not available at all this time. One hypothesis for these results is that students in the codex uh, group were immediately interacting with code, right? Just messing around with, with live code rather than having to struggle through like syntax uh, errors uh, in syntax problems first. The researchers also observed participants in the codex group testing the code. Um, so like to all my CS1 instructors out there, when's the last time you saw students test their code, right? Or when's the last time you saw them like breaking a big function into small functions? Can my, my answer is like, they never do that. But here they are. They seem to have, seem to do this naturally. Uh, they seem to have, I don't know, some sort of built-in distrust for code that's generated by AI. And we need all students to have this. OK, so that's the uh, evidence right now. So Copilot's being used by programmers, and it helps them. Copilot necessitates changes to CS1, and students are able to effectively learn with Copilot. Uh, Leo's going to talk all about our proposed CS1 with Copilot uh, in a bit. But uh, before that, I, wanted, I just wanted to say, we also have an opportunity here to take a fresh look at other longstanding concerns in the CS education community. Um, I'm going to keep this brief. There's obviously way more that could be said, but uh, we need to have these at the front of our mind as we make these large changes to CS1. All right, first, let's talk about the gap between what's taught in CS courses and the needs of industry. Many authors over the years have discussed this gap. Uh, so for example, there's a study from Michelle Craig and her co-authors. They interviewed uh, some early career programmers, and they report, for example, that uh, assignments in school are very well-defined versus the kinds of uh, open-ended, you know, ill-defined projects that they do in industry. 
or um, maybe writing small standalone stuff in school compared to like adding features to large existing programs in industry. And we've also found in our own research that faculty want to help. Okay, they want to improve their curriculum, uh, but there are resource barriers. So it's worth thinking about how LLMs might be able to lessen this gap. We've already talked about programmers just using LLMs in industry, so that's one way we're going to get closer. Uh, but we seem to be at the end of the road for well-defined, super constrained assignments anyway. And maybe, for example, our students could use LLMs to support them as they grapple with an overwhelming new code base. All right, beyond gaps to industry, uh, it's not clear that our students are learning what we like them to learn. Uh, so there, there's a famous problem from the CS education literature. It's called the rainfall problem. And it's all about taking amounts of uh, rainfall. Those are just integers. So integers from the input and just computing the average. And you know you stop when you receive a flag value, like negative 1 or 999 or whatever. Uh, so and generally, what we find after a CS1 is something like half of students get this code wrong. That's at the end of a CS1. We should all be disappointed by this. It's been hypothesized that part of the problem is a mismatch between the looping constructs that programming languages have, like while loops, and the ways that people think about loops. Uh, more broadly, we've had high failure rates in uh, CS courses for decades, uh, and the uh, situation does not appear to be improving. These students who are struggling are also having uh, emotional tolls on the assignments that they do work on. So if syntax and constructs of a programming language are yeah, at least partially to blame here, what's going to happen when we reduce the focus on these through the use of LLMs? This right here, this research possibility is what excites me and Leo the most about this new technology. Thank you, Dan. Um, at this point, we hope you all agree that professionals are using these tools and that students may be able to benefit from learning using them. Uh, as Dan said, LMs may be the catalyst that we need uh, to help address long-standing issues with CS1 outcomes and the academia industry gap. Uh, but before we dive into our vision for teaching CS1, uh, let me give you a brief demo of how students might interact with the LMs, particularly for those of you who haven't started playing with them yet. Right, so let's take a quick look at uh, Copilot tackling a problem from Dan's class last year. Uh, so the, let's take a look at the question. Uh, trainees here are given uh, an ID code, which has five digits, and the first digit can be any digit, but all subsequent digits you have to be either one digit greater or one digit uh, less than the previous digit. And for the assignment, students have to write code to validate an ID and cannot use loops or lists. So let's see how Copilot does with it and then discuss. So here's uh, my interacting with the Copilot chat feature. Uh, and what I've done is I've just copy pasted Dan's description straight from uh, his assignment and just place it straight into the, the interface. And you can see there's a little bit more than I, than I showed in that last slide. We also have some sample inputs and some sample outputs. Um, and then what we're going to do is just ask uh, Copilot uh, for an answer. And what it does is it gives back the pseudocode for the problem. Uh, so if you want to use the pseudocode, it's right there. And then it gives us the code uh, for a solution. And uh, if you take a look at the code briefly, you're going to see that it seems like it's on the right page. Um, if we take a look at the code a little bit more deeply, uh, we realize this is, in fact, uh, a working solution. So we specifically gave Copilot Chat a new problem from Dan's most recent course, um, because that wouldn't be in the training set. Right? This is uh, Dan just taught this course last fall. Um, we also searched GitHub to see if there are any examples of his code there, uh, and yet Despite it not being the training set, Copilot solving it cleanly. Um, let's look at another example. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let me just say uh, what we've seen is that when Copilot works well, we effectively have a new interface for communicating our desires to the computer, right? And hasn't really the last seven years of programming languages been focused on doing exactly this, trying to find new ways for us to communicate with the computer so it isn't quite so hard. Um, if it weren't for this chain of advancement in programming languages, we'd all still be programming in assembly. And I want to point out that we notably, as instructors of CS1, have chosen to not teach students in assembly anymore and to teach them Python. Um, and so what we've already decided is that ease of programming is important for new learners. 
We can also see the Copilot is producing code that's syntactically correct. Now, in our experience with Copilot, we rarely experience syntax set errors, and we can only imagine that LLMs are going to improve um, in this regard. And so at the very least, uh, working with these tools may mean uh, less emphasis on having to teach syntax. Now, if every user prompt unambiguously described the problem and Copilot were always able to generate uh, the correct code uh, that meets the prompt specifications, uh, we could really just end the talk here and frankly be a lot more worried about uh, our jobs and about software engineering jobs in general. Uh, but we all know LLMs make mistakes and humans may, uh, just maybe, uh, struggle writing perfect uh, specifications. So let's take another exam example from Dan's class last fall. Um, here he's asking students to take senses of the form, and this is the uh, second example. Um, Alana eats apples, oranges, kiwis, and bananas. So the expectation is that there are two words, Alana eats, then there's a list of nouns, the word and, and then a final noun. And the goal is to ensure that there's one comma after each noun, and yes, we want to include an Oxford comma. Um, in the first example, we see that the original sentence is missing the commas, and we, the expected output will add the commas. Um, in the second example, there's already a comma after the word oranges, so that comma is going to be preserved, but the missing commas will be added. What makes this tricky for students and possibly tricky for Copilot um, is that students aren't allowed to use if statements or for loops to solve this. Instead, they have to use um, just the replace method. Now, let's take a look at the, the full description of this. So here's the actual full problem description. Uh, don't worry about reading it. But what we're going to do is, just like a student might, um, perhaps without reading entirely, is we're going to just take the assignment, uh, copy it, and put it into Copilot and let Copilot solve it. So here's us doing that. So I've, I've pasted in uh, that full description. Um, and there's a little bit more to the description than I, than I showed. There's um, some additional sample inputs and sample outputs. Um, and then when I when I ran this, uh, it actually took uh, longer for Copilot to give me the answer than I'm showing here. We actually trimmed that part of the video out there. Um, and when we get back uh, from Copilot, um, seems fairly plausible in our first glance, right? There's no conditionals, there's no loops, um, and it's also using the replace method. But if we look at this code a bit more in depth, we can tell pretty quickly that this may not work well. Uh, first, we could just run one of our sample inputs um, and find out that it seems to add commas where they don't belong, and it seems to even cause duplicate commas. Or we could have looked at this line of code here and seen that it puts a comma before the word and, uh, whether or not it needs to. Um, or we could have looked at this line of code, uh, and we'd see that it's replacing spaces with uh, comma spaces, which will add more commas than we need, again, ignoring what was there before. So in this case, Copilot didn't give students the right answer on their first attempt, and they're going to need to learn how to work with these tools in order to get the right answer. So in sum, what we're seeing is that users of LLMs, um, including students who will be learning how to uh, code working with them, uh, will need important software, engineering, important software engineering skills like code testing and code reading. And that segues us to the skills needed to program uh, using LLMs. So we're going to present our vision for a CS1 course that's fully incorporating LLMs and teaches students how to effectively write software using Copilot. Um, in our discussion, I'll be focused on the skills that we need to focus to teach our students. Our vision is informed by our work with Copilot and will be how I teach my course uh, this upcoming fall. Um, we'll know more about its effectiveness as we study it further. But in the meantime, we're excited to share our vision with instructors who may be interested in teaching courses this way this fall, and may be interested in collaborating on uh, course design. All right, so at a high level, we want to talk you through the design cycle of writing software working with Copilot. Um, and this is the design cycle that we've uncovered working with Copilot uh, a great deal over the last six months. Now, let's assume we want to solve a task. Um, at this point, let's assume that we have a task uh, that can be solved in, as a function. Well, we'd start by describing the function and then using that description, description as a prompt. Copilot will then generate code based on that prompt. We'll then get code back and read through that code to see if it seems to be a reasonable solution. If it's not, uh, then we can use the Copilot feature uh, to help uh, explore other suggested solutions and select one which may be better at solving the task. 
if, if we still can't find a plausible solution, we'd have to go back to the prompt to see if we can uh, better describe the problem. Supposing we find code that we like, we can then progress to testing the code. If the code passes our tests, well, we're done with this function. Um, if it doesn't pass these tests, then we have to either go back to the prompt to see what, if we can have it better describe the uh, failed tests, um, or we can go back through the process of finding the bug uh, and where the bug is in the code and correcting that bug, either by modifying the code directly ourselves or by prompting Copilot to generate new code. So everything I've shown here so far is the flow of trying to solve a single task. And we're, again, focused on functions as a primary task in our workflow. But we can't just give a huge problem to Copilot to solve as a single task. Instead, if we're giving a problem that's too large for a single function, then we're going to have to break that down through problem decomposition. And once we've broken that down into solvable tasks, um, then we can start designing our functions uh, from the leaf functions on up. Um, we also want to note that problem decomposition is a valuable tool um, in the function design cycle as well. Uh, if you can't get a good um, piece of code based on a prompt, it's often a time to do problem decomposition and break that into multiple functions. Now, there's a lot involved in the steps of this process that I just described. So what I'd like to do is just talk about the skills that students need to perform these steps. All right, so the, the first skill is a function pro design and prompting. So students need to know how to articulate a task by describing its behavior. For functions, we found that Copilot um, gives better answers when we provide the function signature, which means that students need to know how to briefly describe the function, its expected inputs, and its expected output. Um, then we need to be able to, to describe the function's behavior as precisely and as briefly as we can. Um, and we found Copilot does better uh, when we write these as doc strings rather than as comments. And so this is an example of a function along with uh, its corresponding doc string. One student's, uh, and the next skill is code reading and selection. So um, once students have the suggested code from Copilot, and you can see here, this is the code that Copilot gave us for that prompt, um, students will need the skill of reading in order to under determine if the suggested code is doing what they want. Uh, if the code does not seem to meet their needs, they're going to need to be able to read through a number of suggested code options from Copilot to determine which may work. And if none work, they'll have to return to prompting or possibly even uh, more problem decomposition. Now, in this case, Copilot gave us a reasonable answer uh, as the first suggestion, and so we'd move over to testing. Um, but if it hadn't, I might move on to suggestions like these on the right. Now, in VS Code, you can see these suggestions just by pressing Control Enter. Uh, Notably, the second suggestion here uh, seems pretty plausible and it's actually pretty close to correct. So I could imagine students thinking this answer, the second suggestion here is correct. Um, in which case, if they were to select that, they'd have to catch the bug in it um, during testing. After they have the plausible solution in hand, the next skill is code testing. Students will be, need to be able to author tests and to ensure that the code has the correct functionality. Um, this will also require that they be able to read and understand the code so they know what tests to run. Right? They'll need to be able, they need to be taught how to do open and closed box testing, and they'll also need to learn how to write tests for the common case as well as edge cases. Uh, it'll be good to teach them multiple ways to test, and uh, we're partial to doc test. Uh, in the code on the right, we've added a couple of test cases for doc test. Uh, both of which pass on this suggestion from Copilot. All right, if there's the next step is debugging. And so if they're stuck with their prompts and they've decomposed the, the problem as much as they possibly think they can, they'll need to turn over to uh, debugging. And here is where uh, we would have students using the VS Code debugger uh, just running on that segment of code. Um, students will need to be able to be taught how to add breakpoints, how to monitor the state of variables, um, and essentially just how to use a debugger to understand what's happening as the code executes. Now, this is our code running on a test case of uh, an array with four minus two and one um, in the array, and we're at the second update to min inside the loop. Uh, in the debugger, we can see that min is currently four and num is one, and so min is just about to be updated to the correct answer of uh, one. Uh, beyond learning how to debug, um, teaching students how to interact with the debugger and follow the state of variables from execution 
uh, can help students develop machine models for execution um, and help them better understand uh, how their code works. Now, notably, this is a skill that we haven't taught explicitly in our existing uh, CS1 courses. And at least anecdotally talking to other faculty, um, they tend to not teach debugging as an explicit skill either. And so we're quite excited about teaching this in detail um, in our upcoming course. The next skill is problem decomposition. And so students need to be able to take a large task and break this into smaller pieces. Their goal is to create a design where each function is solvable by copilot. So the example here is uh, decomposing the task of, of creating a basic video game um, into smaller functions, each of which was then solved by copilot with just a little bit of assistance. We suspect problem decomposition is going to be a challenging task for students, uh, but it's actually one of the most important skills, I'd argue, uh, to know as a programmer. Uh, and so for students to develop the, the skill, um, we'll need to scaffold students in a number of uh, really important ways. Uh, they'll need to be able to learn what's a reasonable task uh, for Copilot, which means they'll need to be given plenty of tasks that are of the correct size, uh, and examples of how to recognize when a task needs to be broken down into subtasks. They'll also need to see examples of instructors breaking down problems along with descriptions of why the instructors are making the choices that they're making to help students get insight into the actual process of problem decomposition. Now, similar to testing, we think problem decomposition isn't commonly taught in CS1. And this is because uh, use of auto graders, uh, which is really common in uh, lots of large classes at schools, including my own, um, those, that use of auto graders uh, makes it so instructors do the problem decomposition for the students and so that they can grade for partial credit. And so we're really excited uh, to be teaching students uh, the skill in the new course design. The last skill is identifying useful modules. And, and we haven't talked about the skill yet, but often part of good design of software in Python is determining if there are modules that could help you solve the task. Um, we found that Copilot actually does better at generating uh, code, correct code, when it's told which module to use. Um, and conveniently, Copilot Chat is actually quite good at uh, identifying which modules might be the most helpful. Um, here's an example of my asking uh, uh, Copilot Chat which library would be good to use for adding a watermark to an image, um, and it uh, reasonably suggests using Pillow. Uh, beyond identifying uh, possible modules to help Copilot, um, it can also give students uh, the pros and cons of using each module uh, and whether each module can require ins installation. I've actually been really impressed uh, by Copilot chat um, when I've had conversations with it about which modules to use. Um, we want to mention this skill specifically because knowing what modules to use for a particular task can help broaden the range of problems solved by students. Um, in a traditional CS1, we may only teach students a few modules, and although they may become comfortable working with those modules, I've seen students really struggle if asked to use a module that they're unfamiliar with. And we believe that teaching module selection explicitly uh, will help students be able to solve new problems both in the course and after our course is over. So we've, I want to do a quick aside on assessment. Um, we've talked a lot about how traditional CS assignments, uh, particularly those that are set for auto grading, again, that are used really commonly at large schools, including my own, um, are going to be really heavily impacted uh, by Copilot. Uh, and the question just becomes, well, what do we do instead? Well, I think assessments are going to need to change. And here are some of the ideas that we have and that we could explore when we're designing these new assessments. Now, one option could be giving students more open-ended tasks. Um, these assignments will allow students to be creative in their solutions, which could help engage more students um, and avoid issues with academic integrity. Um, an example of a creative task would be creating image collages, uh, like those commonly done today in courses using uh, Barb, uh, Barb Erickson and Mark Dial's media computation curriculum. On the right is uh, such an assignment done by students in one of my courses. Another idea that we like comes from Lori Jacques uh, in ACM Inroads last month. Uh, she argues that we could have students create different representations of the same concepts, uh, just as they do in math education. And I'd encourage you to take a look at her article. Um, I think there's a lot that we could do as instructors with this idea. 
Uh, for example, we could have students create flowcharts that capture the behavior of a particular piece of code as an, an alternative representation than the code itself. A third example is to use the computer-based testing facilities like they have set up at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, these uh, test facilities have computers running uh, controlled environments to help ensure academic integrity. Now, many of the faculty using those testing facilities uh, at UIUC are also using a tool called Prairie Learn, which I believe is being augmented uh, right now to allow students to use Copilot for some questions, um, and the instructor can essentially say which questions uh, the student should have Copilot access to or not. Uh, the setup at UIUC um, already gives students the ability to get more practice and to take uh, more frequent exams, which is just generally good for students overall, right? Um, but for our purposes, it would allow us to specify parts of the exam where the students don't have access to Copilot and other parts of the exam where students would in fact have access to Copilot. And so for you could give uh, a semi-large open-ended task and have students solve it during the exam uh, with Copilot as an aid. All right, thanks, Leo. So just to summarize, here are all the skills that we're excited to be teaching in our upcoming version of CS1. And we think most instructors would be excited about teaching these skills. In our experience, testing, decomposition, they're generally not taught much in CS1. And this absence limits uh, the ability of students to take on large problems. Moreover, explicitly teaching students how to find and use new modules can broaden the range of problems uh, that they can solve uh, um, after they finish the course. So rather than spending an entire term teaching students how to write single functions with, you know, maybe like half of students not being able to write a function like rainfall, which is uh, seriously not a good outcome for CS1, we believe a CS1 with Copilot will result in students being able to solve larger programming tasks in a broader range of domains, and this will make them more capable of writing software. So LLMs certainly introduce new opportunities, as we've uh, spent the past 40 minutes uh, saying, uh, but uh, there are some new challenges, and I'd like to mention a few of these. This is by no means exhaustive. The first one I want to mention is we've been focused on CS1 here, but uh, we don't think this is the only course that will be impacted uh, by LLMs. So for example, think about a data structures course, right? We often have students implementing stuff from scratch, like linked lists, binary search trees, things like that. Uh, if those are take home assignments, then you probably um, uh, assumed, and this would be correct, that Copilot is just going to solve these very well. So we're not going to be able to use those anymore. The second concern is monetary. Uh, so right now, Copilot and similar tools are free for students. But uh, what's going to happen if they start charging? Things are going to get tricky in that case. Uh, so we could uh, consider going back to just you know, banning the use of these tools. Uh, but if we do that, then the students who have money are just going to buy them and use them anyway. And so we'll have a serious equity problem. Alternately, if we mandate use for all students, we need to figure out who's going to pay for this. The third uh, challenge is ethical. Well, we've likely all seen the discussions in the media uh, about concerns around code ownership uh, and bias in the models. Uh, we share the argument made by Tyson Kendon, Leanne Wu, and John Acock at Wixi earlier this year. Uh, if students are going to be using these tools, we should be teaching key ethical concerns to them. And ultimately, we need to remember that students will use these tools, period, right? They'll use them whether we say they can or they can't. This fall, uh, we're going to be teaching a class based on this approach at UC San Diego and are happy to share or collaborate um, on course materials over the summer. Um, the book to support the course is an early access uh, through our publisher, Manning Publications. Um, right now, the first four chapters are available, and we foresee uh, more chapters being released at a fairly quick pace over the next couple months, um, so that the full book is available electronically before the ter fall term starts. Um, I'm going to be using uh, the book for my course, so it will be ready in time uh, for, my, for my term, at least electronically. Um, we also have an aspirational goal of having physical print copies being available by September, um, but that's going to depend on a lot of factors, and so we're hesitant to promise that. Um, if you are a CS1 instructor and want a copy of the book to review before the fall, please uh, just email me to get a, an instructor copy. I'm happy to share it. And my email is at the bottom of this page. I'll be bottom on the next slide as well. 
Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the many colleagues um, that we have at University of Toronto, University of California, San Diego, and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who've been helpful in design our uh, in the design of the book, as well as our upcoming course this next fall. Um, and with that, we'd, we're, we'd like to take your questions and are open for discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Leo and Dan, that's awesome. So we have more than 50 questions and oh, about 12 <laughs> minutes. Um, so I've been trying to uh, take the question. I haven't even looked at the chat because I can't keep up with both and hear the talk, um, but I've been trying to take the questions out of the question and answer and group them into some topics so that we can have one question from each area. So um, a couple of people, let's start with, um, this, let's start with a question about uh, pedagogy and, uh, and learning goals, or maybe it's not learning goals, but um, so Edmund asks, presumably the students will have to have some understanding of programming to evaluate Copilot's solution. So do you have to teach programming first before use of Copilot? Yeah, do you want this one or do you want me to take it? Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, so, uh, so Leo and I agree. Uh, so, so it's not, so to, to us, this is not, um, just, you know, put the problem in, get the answer out and, and, and game over. Right. Uh, so for example, in our book, we spend two chapters on reading code and we definitely think that's necessary, right? So you're going to get code back and, uh, you're going to, you're going to want to be able to, I mean, if the code doesn't work, you're going to want to be able to fix it for sure. But also we think there's value in just being able to get an overview of what the code is doing, right? Does it look, so we talk about a lot in the book about does the code look reasonable? And um, part of knowing whether code's reasonable, like experts do this, right? They, they are, you know, they're experts partially because they can look at code and be like, eh, you know what, nah, this is bad, right? Uh, and you're not gonna catch every bug like this, right? But, but you know, uh, Leo and I and everybody else here can do that. And so we want our students to still be able to do this, right? So code reading is a big focus uh, that we have. We totally agree. Great. So staying on the curriculum theme, Yang asks, the new vision may seem like a new class instead of a revision of CS1. Knowing how to use AI to write code in a more efficient way may still need to understand, need the understanding of the code itself. Would it be ultimately a separate course or workshop that teaches people how who already can write decent code, for example, past CS1, to write code more efficiently? Or can it be organically plugged into the current CS1 curriculum? So I'm guessing Yang hasn't yet looked at an instructor copy of your book, but maybe you could at least uh, address that question. Probably that's shared by, oh, some other number of the 1,600 <laughs> people watching our <laughs> talk. Uh, so I think that's like a fantastic question. Uh, where this fits in the curriculum isn't entirely clear to us, but I do want to say um, if we look at the learning goals, and um, let me jump to those. I've actually got those uh, here available. Um, if you kind of run through the learning goals, um, these are based on Bloom's taxonomy. This is um, uh, knowledge level, comprehension level, application level. What we're, what we're seeing are things like uh, being able to work with loops and functions and dictionaries uh, and modules in Python. Uh, we would also have um, at the next level of Bloom's taxonomy, we've got um, designing tests, um, fixing bugs in Python code, um, being able to write complete and correct Python code uh, using a top-down design. Um, these feel to me uh, similar enough to see that CS1 that I'd argue this is a good replacement for a CS1, but I think it's not just CS1 that's going to end up changing because of uh, these tools. And so I think a lot of our curriculum may be changed and it's unclear to me at this point how everything's going to shake out. Okay, great. I There's a number of questions about assessment. Um, I'm not sure that got the best one out of them, but maybe you could just address assessment. So the simplest question was Arno who asked, how does assessment look like in this new model? Um, but, and there were a number of other variations of that. Leo. Oh, sure, and in yeah. particular, someone asked about how we do assessment with really large numbers of students. So if you have a course with 800 or a thousand, not an assessment in a small, small class where we can imagine what you might do. 
I, I think that's a, a great question. Assessment's been at the forefront of our mind. Um, obviously, we've designed assessments and research and stuff. So this is this is core to us. Um, I think there are a lot of factors at play. I think um, I want students still to be writing code, and I want them to be solving large assignments. But I really do believe in open-ended assignments, and uh, this is going to be tricky for large classes because we've been able to use auto graders for a long time, and I'm not sure if auto graders are still going to be a good fit for some of these large assignments. And so. Uh, I'm encouraged by some of the, the interesting work um, some of my colleagues at UCSD have done where they have students record videos of them walking through the code for their assignment, and those videos are what's recorded, um, so I can see doing that. Um, I'm personally really excited about uh, the computer-based testing facilities um, that, are, that are at UAUC. Um, Craig Zellis gave a, a talk at UCSD recently, and uh, I think we're really planning to adopt it this fall, and the advantage of those testing facilities is that we can write uh, lots and lots of questions with randomization, and then the students can uh, do these as homework. Um, I think a lot of questions will actually be classic written questions of trace this code, or what's the state of the code at this point in time, or uh, given this code, how would you explain uh, in a short sentence, like explaining plain English? Um, I think there's a lot of questions that we can still leverage from our previous versions um, on homeworks and things like that. Um, for tests, though, um, I'm really excited about these test-based facilities because I would like some portion of the exam to be without Copilot, right? Having them explain what the code does, things like that. I want them to be able to do that without Copilot um, at times. And then in other parts of the exam, I want to just give them a large task and say, use Copilot just as the flow through the class has been and solve this larger task. Um, and uh, I think that's that's going to be really valuable having these test facilities, especially in large classes. Is there anything you want to add to that, Dan, or is or does that summarize things well? Yeah. So I just noticed somebody in the chat said we need a whole new webinar for assessments, and uh, that's I, I pretty much agree. <laughs> so we can leave it there for now. Okay, great. Um, so there's been a couple of questions about curriculum. Uh, what other things could fit in the curriculum? So Jane asked, do the presenters see a place in any new CS1 with data-driven programming paradigms for social and ethical considerations? And also asks, for, asks, do you think that the LLMs are an opportunity to have a resurgence in requirements analysis and logical design? And actually, let's stop it there for the curriculum question. Someone else asked about prompt engineering, but we'll take that one next. Mm, yeah, um, uh, there's a lot to say here. Um, so the, the challenges brought by LLMs, um, political challenge, uh, challenges, ethical challenges, uh, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll take some time for us as a society uh, to catch up. And there's this talk that uh, Leo and I uh, like to recommend uh, by Tyson Kendon, Leanne Wu, and John Acock. Uh, and it was at Wixie just a couple months ago, and the paper was called AI Generated Code Not Considered Harmful. And what they argue, and um, we we definitely recommend like watching watching that talk. Uh, it's totally worth it. Uh, but this is such an opportunity for us to teach ethical implications of LLMs. So, uh, do we think there's a space for this in CS1? 100%. Yes, uh, Leo. I completely agree. I mean, I think this is, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of teaching ethics in the curriculum. Um, I was an advocate for adding ethics as a learning goal to our, mm. to our program. Um, and I think uh, this is a chance for us to say, we're bringing in these tools. We know there's ethical in, uh, implications of these tools. Let's talk about the ethics of these. And then once you start talking about ethics, I mean, it allows you to talk about ethics and other topics um, in your CS1 course. Okay, great. And staying on the curriculum theme slightly, um, Jose asks, what's your view on the skills to do good prompt engineering? In the end, Copilot is a sort of programmer and we are the customers and customers in classical software engineering often do not state well the requirements of the product or the programmer do not understand it well. Is that, is that an issue when using LLMs for programming? You certainly need to understand uh, what they're trying to solve with the function well. And that's that's why we're such a big fan of teaching problem decomposition early in the courses. Uh, with teaching problem decomposition, uh, 
the students are going to break down the problem. They're going to have an idea what each function should do. They should have specifications for each of those functions, and then they should put those into prompts. Um, I think the the challenge, and, and this isn't directly what was asked, but I think one of the challenges when we were writing the book and the challenge um, for us as teachers is uh, as experienced programmers, we tend to use uh, a certain language about uh, technology and software. And we feel like the prompts respond very well to that language, right? If you say, I need you to open a file in read-only mode and then do blah, 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 blah. Um, Copilot does a great job with that. But we're going to need to teach students that similar language of describing the specifications in, in a technical language. Great. Okay. So Peter asks about process. He says, are there any thoughts to the evaluation of the process instead of just the final product? For instance, mandate that students submit the prompts they used to iterate and troubleshoot their program throughout the development process. I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Peter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're looking for more assignments, uh, and so you, you really helped. Uh, I, I, I completely agree. I think um, some of the test questions we were already imagining is um, what test cases would you write for this uh, for this prompt? Like, given given this prompt, what test cases you, should you be writing to uh, see if the function works properly? And that's process. Um, the prompts themselves, I think, we could grade in terms of how well the problems described. Um, I wouldn't. I uh, want to put them through Copilot and then see if the answer is right. That's that's one of the catches is uh, the non-determinism makes things really hard for students. It makes it really hard for grading. It honestly made it really hard for writing the book uh, because we just don't know. The prompt could be completely reasonable and Copilot could give you the wrong answer sometimes and sometimes they'll give you the right answer. Um, and so it wouldn't be auto-graded, but we could certainly manually grade um, those prompts and say, yeah, that seems like a reasonable way of describing the problem. I love the idea. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, critical skills too, right, Leo? Like um, just working through the process of, okay, I put a prompt in, I'm not getting a good result back. Now, what do I do next? Right. This, this whole like back and forth, uh, with the LLM, it would be amazing to be able to capture that process data. It actually sounds like something that would be fun to grade, which is kind of weird for me to say. <laughs> yeah. And, and we have, um, these diagrams, like this process diagram that I have here. Um, those diagrams are in the book. We're actually teaching process on the whole. Yeah. Way through. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Greg asks, Will the use of LLMs further marginalize students for whom English is not a first or a strong language? Hmm. It's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, a challenge that's been faced by students in existing CS1s already because of, of code being in English. Um, there's some really good work by uh, Gerald Susai Raj on uh, non-native English speakers and, and learning how to program. I don't know if people have looked at how well uh, these tools respond to non-English, and I haven't played with that myself. So I, I don't feel like I can give an informed answer on that. Yeah, there's also a, a similar concern about uh, bias in training data. So one of our concerns is that it has less context uh, for projects that may be of interest, uh, that may be culturally relevant to certain populations uh, over others. So that there's obviously work to do there. Okay, we have time for one more question. So I just thought I'd give you a real doozy. Um, so it's been asked twice by uh, T. Harris and Mark Friedman, both said uh, sort of the same thing. I'll, I'll read the shorter one. Even if CS1 intro to programming still exists, say five years from now, what should it look like based on Copilot, not of 2023, but of 2028? If Copilot of 2028, <laughs> uh, is able to take a vague human description and always give the human back what they want. Uh, I don't know what CS looks like at that point. It's going to be a completely different world. Um, I think the LLMs are going to keep making mistakes. I think the, the mistakes are going to get narrowed, though. Um, and this process that we're describing, um, it will adapt, I think, fairly well um, as the uh, tools get better. Great. Well, we're out of time for today. Um, I'd like to thank Dan and Leo again for their informative presentation and insightful answers to the oh, 15 out of 70 questions that we actually <laughs> got to. Um, a special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and to participate today. This talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. 
You can find announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and at acm.org. Also, please fill out the quick survey where you can suggest future talks or, or topics or speakers, and you'll see the survey on your screen in just a moment. So on behalf of ACM, Dan Zangaro and Leo Porter and myself, Michelle Craig, thanks again for joining us. And I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes the talk. Thank you. Thank you.